Good morning. I am Diana Tomback, uh, representing the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation and the University of Colorado Denver. My co-presenter is Eric Sprague, representing American Forests. We are presenting today on the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan and its potential application to other high five pines. Here is an overview of the presentation. White bark pine, a keystone and foundation species, is experiencing population declines. White bark pine has been proposed for listing as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Other western five-needled white pines are declining from similar threats. In 2016, the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation and American Forests proposed the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan to the U.S. Forest Service. Other partners included other federal agencies and tribal jurisdictions. The plan identifies 20 to 30 percent of white bark pines range for priority restoration. The plan addresses multiple challenges and barriers to restoration. We feel that the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan can be a model for restoration planning for other five needle white pines. White bark pine ranges from the southern Sierra Nevada north nearly 20 degrees latitude to British Columbia and Alberta. The range includes about 32.6 million hectares, almost 81 million acres. The U.S. range represents 70 percent of this, or about 23 million hectares or 56 million acres. Of the U.S. range, 88 percent is owned by federal agencies and 29% of the U.S. range is in wilderness. The analysis of FIA data by Goking and Islar 2018 indicates the extent of white bark pines decline. As of 2016, 51% of standing white bark pine in the U.S. were dead. Note that most of the Rocky Mountain distribution uh, has less than 50% basal area remaining, with less than 30% remaining in the northeastern part of the range. The existential threat to white bark pine is white pine blister rust caused by the pathogen Carnarshium rubicola, but many mature trees have been killed historically by mountain pine beetles and within the last two decades. Mortality from both threats is depicted in this map from the U.S. Forest Service Forest Health Protection. This is a heat map with the highest threats depicted in red at a watershed level. Additional threats to white bark pine include changing fire regimes and climate change interconnected. Until the last two decades, the major concern was loss of white bark pine basal area from advancing succession. Now the concerns are increasing fire frequency and severity and loss of white bark pine forests. Climate change as a threat is both the driver and a stressor. It drives pine beetle outbreaks. It has led to drought stress and higher tree mortality, and it is altering the distribution of white pine blisterust across white bark pines range. It's also potentially influencing white bark pine distribution at different scales. In this slide, Warwell et al. 2007 depict the boundary between the northern U.S. Rockies and the southern uh, Canadian Rockies, and they illustrate the potential rain shift of white bark pine from climate change over the decades. Here is the conservation status of white bark pine. In 2011, three years following a petition to list white bark pine from the Natural Resources Defense Council, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a 12-month decision, warranted but precluded. In other words, the data on white bark pine indicated that declines were real, but a decision on listing was precluded by workload at Fish and Wildlife Service. Meanwhile, in 2012, 
Canada listed white bark pine as endangered under the Species at Risk Act. In 2018, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service released the white bark pine species status assessment. And on December 2nd, 2020, the service published a proposal to list white bark pine as threatened. Management of white bark pine is distributed among several federal agencies and Native American tribal governments. The largest land manager of white bark pine is the U.S. Forest Service, responsible for 74%. Uh, this is depicted on the map in green. National Park Service uh, at 10% uh, of the range is depicted on the map in purple. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management manages 4% of white bark pines distribution, and that's uh, depicted in yellow green on the map. And then Native American lands, uh, BIA, state lands, private, together account for 12% of white bark pines distribution. Uh, tribal lands are depicted on the map in sort of a yellow peach color. A closer view of where these tribal lands with white bark pine are in the West, we have the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon, the Yakima and Colville in Washington State. In Montana, we have the Salish Kootenai and the Blackfeet. And in Wyoming, we have the Wind River Reservation with the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes. We can see multiple barriers to devising a white bark pine restoration plan. Large distribution in the U.S. alone, multiple jurisdictions and need for leadership and coordination, limited federal funding, limited field personnel, um, limited knowledge of conservation and restoration actions, and wilderness restrictions on restoration treatments. Regarding the application of the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan to other high five pines, there are several five needle white pines in need of restoration and in planning. Examples here are sugar pine, foxtail pine, southwestern white pine, limber pine, following white bark closely behind and as to population declines, and Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine. So a brief overview of the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan. It is a geographic plan based on identifying priority areas for restoration. The core areas represent 20 to 30 percent of white bark pines range within a given management jurisdiction. So why 20 to 30 percent? Less may not succeed in restoring white bark pine, more may be cost prohibitive. The selection of core areas is guided by biological criteria and especially by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's species status assessment framework. We have divided the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan into two phases. Phase one is about assembling the plan and its components and phase two is about a funding strategy and implementing the plan. The plan is based on building genetic resistance to blister rust, but also climate adaptation through seedling planting. As trees mature, Clark's nutcrackers will disperse seeds outside core areas. Range-wide recovery will follow it will take multiple human and tree generations to accomplish this. Here is a cartoon that depicts our vision. Restored forests in core areas will serve as resistant gene dissemination centers. Planted seedlings will eventually produce mature trees and seeds from these trees will be dispersed by Clark's nutcrackers. Clark's nutcracker seed dispersal flights uh, can be as far as 30 kilometers. So over time, the birds will disperse resistant genotypes outside the core areas and eventually restore the range of white bark pine. 
Here is a brief history and timeline on the development of the National Whitebark Pine Restoration Plan. In 2016, the Whitebark Pine Ecosystem Foundation and American Forests jointly proposed the plan to U.S. Forest Service leadership. With the plan accepted, in 2017, we began laying groundwork. This began with a rollout letter from the National Forest System Deputy Chief. We then conducted a management practices workshop with Whitebark Pine Restoration experts and managers from both the United States and Canada. We held teleconferences with National Park Service and the uh, Bureau of Land Management personnel, as well as uh, Forest Service regions with whitebark pine. We conducted a major summit uh, with over 100 people in attendance to get feedback about the plan. In 2018, a liaison committee for the National Whitebark Pine Restoration Plan was appointed with representation from each agency uh, and from tribes. We also issued Data Call 1 in 2018, requesting new distributional information about whitebark pine and new health information. From 2019 to the present, we've been acquiring components for the plan, the building blocks, and this has been through Data Call 2A and 2B. In June, 2022, we expect to have a draft of the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan. As I mentioned previously, Data Call 1 was for the purpose uh, for requesting any new distributional information on white bark pine and health status information to help us with uh, future data calls. And Clearly, for a given jurisdiction, the first step in core area nominations is to generate a distribution map. So a comment about jurisdictions. Each federal agency made its decision about what it would consider a jurisdiction. So BLM uh, divided its white bark pine areas by state field office, National Park Service by national park, and the U.S. Forest Service by region. Tribal lands are autonomous by reservation. Data call 2A and 2B requested the building blocks for the plan. Data call 2A requested core area nominations in the format of map polygons, white bark pine health status for each nominated polygon, and the criteria and the process used to nominate polygons. Data Call 2B requested proposed restoration actions for each nominated polygon and estimated implementation costs based on a price list that we provided. We also requested monitoring and adaptive management plans for the different restoration actions. This was to ensure that restoration treatments accomplished their goals or to see if they required a different management approach. The support information we provided for data call 2A, core area nominations, were major concepts from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Species Status Assessment Framework. This framework is also used for the agency's recovery plans. This framework is based on principles of conservation biology and biological criteria very appropriate for our restoration plan. Here are some examples of biological criteria that could be used to identify core areas for nomination. This list is not ranked in any particular order. And these different criteria uh, could be used individually or to, together with some ranking scenario. Examples include climate change refugia. Connectivity is very important. Levels of res genetic resistance to blister rust, genetic diversity, watershed protection, um, mature trees and cone production. All these are important values. So just quickly here, the basic components of the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan. Nominated core areas from each jurisdiction, criteria used to select the core areas and the process, proposed restoration actions within the core areas, 
implementation cost estimates for these restoration actions and a monitoring and adaptive management plan for the different restoration actions. Some additional detail about data call 2A and the approach to it. There are multiple approaches to core area nominations and they range from very detailed and complex to much more straightforward. All approaches are valid if they use objective and consistent criteria. So which approach is selected by a jurisdiction depends on how much white bark pine range they have, the data layers available, whether to integrate multiple values uh, for biological criteria, for example, and the technical support available to them. So I'd like to show you a few examples of different approaches to core area nominations. Uh, for example, uh, we have the Bureau of Land Management. There are three field offices, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, that have white bark pine within ju their jurisdiction. And we have the example here from Montana. Uh, Montana used a ranking system based on a series of criteria and their own stand information. The purple stars are areas in which their core area nominations reside. Most of these stars, as we see from this uh, FHP map layer, are in areas of high blister rust and pine beetle mortality. Another example, uh, this one from the National Park Service. I'll just point out that Wyoming, Montana, Oregon, California, and Washington uh, have national parks with white bark pine in their jurisdiction. Uh, Yosemite and Sequoia Kings Canyon uh, are the examples here. They conducted one day workshops to identify the criteria for core area nomination and then to rank the areas and make the nominations. Here is an example of a complex process. Uh, we formed a working group to do the core area nominations with Region 1. And we followed the methods used by the Crown of the Continent Ecosystem High Five Working Group. So the steps we used mirror those used by the Crown of the Continent, and here they are. First one was to estimate white bark pine's range using data layers both potential and existing. Step two was to identify areas of high conservation value with multiple data layers that had to be integrated. Step three was to identify threats and stressors, again, um, multiple data layers. Step four, delineate the core areas. So we selected 30% of the potential range while maximizing conservation value. And then once we had the core areas identified, we did step five, we identified the distribution of threats and stressors within these core areas. And here are the recommended core area nominations for region one. Uh, they were based on a conservation value of greater or equal to 29. And the polygons were buffered uh, with the 250 meter buffer. So the core area nominations ended up being 32% of the potential range of white bark pine in Region 1. For data call 2B, it was essential that we had consensus on appropriate restoration treatments and actions for different white bark pine conditions. And we distributed with data call 2B the document restoration and management treatments for white bark pine communities that was the outcome of the 2017 teleconference. Uh, all told, we had input for 17 scientists and managers from the US and Canada. The document was much revised and expanded since that 2017 workshop. I'm speaking now for Eric Sprague from American Forest. With the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan in place, public and private partners will be better able to prioritize limited funding, develop local partnerships to restore targeted core areas, and engage in fundraising and communications effort. So American Forest previously launched such a campaign for longleaf pine in the southeastern United States. 
Restoration costs for the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan will be large and require many different funding sources. Examples include existing and new high five partnerships, public private partnerships led by NGOs such as American Forests and the National Forest Foundation, existing and new federal programs such as U.S. Forest Service's White Bark Pine Restoration Program. New potential funding sources exist in pending congressional legislation. And there are new national and global initiatives that have potential, such as America the Beautiful and the 30 by 30 initiative. Of course, there's the Trillion Tree Campaign and others. There is unprecedented interest in how forests can help meet climate and biodiversity goals. 1T.org, the Trillion Tree Campaign, was launched in 2019 by the World Economic Forum to lead the movement. 1T.org is bringing corporations, governments, and civil society groups together to conserve, restore, and plant 1 trillion trees by 2030. With the restoration planning in place, White Bark Pine Restoration should be a stellar project that attracts support. American Forests is co-leading the U.S. chapter of 1T.org with the World Economic Forum. Already significant commitments have been made from the corporate sector. 1T.org stakeholders and donors are addressing reforestation challenges and not just planting seedlings. High Five Restoration strategies can lead to package restoration actions. Furthermore, the Restoration Hub developed by the Nature Conservancy and American Forests and Partnership, has identified more than 5 million acres of white bark pine range with restoration opportunities. The National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan is one of the most ambitious restoration plans attempted. The listing of white bark pine will be the start of a campaign by American Forests, White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, and other partners to initiate a multi-year restoration effort engaging in phase two. The campaign will draw on amazing video from Cornell Lab of Ornithology and other resources to raise awareness. Major legislation in Congress, if passed, will help restoration efforts. The infrastructure bill, for example, includes the Replant Act that lifts the annual cap off the Restoration Trust Fund this would triple reforestation funding for the U.S. Forest Service. The same bill has $200 million to implement the federal seedling strategy. The proposed federal budget includes hundreds of millions of dollars for forest resilience and adaptation, all relevant to white bark pine restoration. There will be opportunities to leverage funding through public-private partnerships, including MOUs and stewardship agreements. For example, American Forest just developed a four-year MOU with BLM, Idaho, and Montana to restore their white bark pine nominated core areas. BLM is bringing endangered species funding to the table and American Forest is matching with corporate funding. To expand opportunity for high five restoration, we need to expand the stakeholder base and leverage new and existing partnerships. We need to communicate opportunities and reduce barriers. The structured approach of the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan, as we just presented, can serve as the basis for restoration planning for the other high five species. Steps one through five provide a roadmap for building plans. Steps six through 10 provide the pathway for implementation of the plan and successful completion. The National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan addresses the fundamental challenges that large-scale restoration poses. Challenges such as what framework to use for prioritizing areas, how to plan across multiple jurisdictions, how to deal with large ranges and their complex logistics, the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan is a model that presents solutions, solutions such as 
working with the species status assessment framework for identifying core areas, coordinating with and among partner agencies and tribes, developing a funding model for implementation. Well, thanks for your patience during this presentation. We appreciate your support of our work and we look forward to your questions and discussion. Some quick thanks here. Most of all, to all of those who contributed to the data calls, to the US Forest Service, our partners, the Liaison Committee, some key players, the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, and American Forests. Thank you.